Cool. Well, thanks for coming, guys. Uh, so today we'll be talking, interestingly, although there are only three of you here, there's, uh, this seemed to be the topic that was of the most interest to the most students in this class. So hopefully they'll watch online and they're probably busy working away on their final projects right now. Uh, before we get started, a couple announcements that you should know. Uh, homework 4 is due June 5, today is June 3rd, so I guess you've got two days. Uh, you know, the usual late day policy applies, right? You can uh, turn in late at your own peril, uh, and they, namely if you uh, lose a couple points per day and eventually it goes down to zero. Uh, homework 4 I think is particularly challenging, especially the theory problems if you're not used to pushing around these gamma ijk objects and r ijkl and all these, all of our favorite tensors in differential geometry. Uh, grading so, will be very generous. Yes, grading, grading will be generous and we're happy to help you guys out with grade, like just come ask. Um, it's, uh, these are, uh, to me these are calculations that everybody has to do at least once in their life to acknowledge that differential geometry is hard. Um, and that you sort of acknowledge that and, and thankfully they're in books and, and we can look at them. Anyway, uh, good, uh, but it's good, it's good for the soul and good for your, your, your bookkeeping and, and future accounting skills. Uh, that aside, uh, your project is due the next day. Uh, don't think this is a stressful thing as much as we were generous with your homework for due date, just FYI. Uh, but and, uh, if, if you have project concerns, you can, come, you can also come to Office Hours and ask us. There's, uh, we actually have already received one final project completed as of this morning. So. Um, that was exciting. In fact, it is an implementation of what we're going to cover today in lecture. Uh, so this is a very brave student. Uh, and and, and uh, finally, there are one or two people that are still, I guess, well, exactly two people that are left to be scribes. Um, June 6th, the reason we chose it for your project due date is that it's like the latest possible day we can have and still give you grades and, and let you graduate from Stanford, if that's your uh, intention this year. Uh, so so I, I, I put here that, that if you're going to scribe, you need to turn it in uh, by that day, um, which I think is reasonable. If, if you're a scribe for this week and you need an extra day for like Wednesday, uh, then we'll, we'll check to figure out what makes sense. And finally, uh, Stanford tells us that we officially need to encourage you to fill out your course review form for CS468. Um, this course, as you might have figured out, is certainly an experimental course and the first time it's offered. Um, well, it's not likely to be offered next year because this class covers a bunch of different topics in the same course number. Uh, chances are, uh, Adrian, myself, or one of our colleagues elsewhere will reuse some part of this material in a similar course sometime in the future. So your feedback is much appreciated. Uh, and, and certainly, um, we, we've attempted to cover all kinds of different topics in this class this, this, this quarter. And uh, we'd be curious to hear which ones you like, which ones were a little bit tough to follow, and, and, and what you'd like to see next time. Uh, that aside, uh, cer certainly uh, we, we appreciate those of you good guys that are coming and, 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 and hope you've gotten some out of it. So anyway, are there any questions about procedural stuff before I uh, dive right into today's, uh, today's lecture talk? Cool. Alright. So until now in CS468, we mostly dealt with static geometry. Right? We've talked a lot about these different analysis problems, like finding curvature, finding descriptors, finding distances, and intrinsic information about a surface. And for the most part, our surface that we've dealt with has stayed the same. Right? We, we, we've done things like found vibration modes, and eigenvalues, and eigenhomers. Or, um, the type of dynamics that we've talked about for the most part have been dynamics along a surface. Right? For instance, um, a couple of issues ago, we talked about the solution to the heat equation and the wave equation. Uh, as heat and waves propagate along the piece of geometry. But what we haven't talked about is how to represent geometry as the geometry itself is changing. Right? This topic comes up every once in a while. Uh, certainly, deformation is an important topic in computer graphics, and it's something that's very well studied. Um, and thankfully for us, the theory of differential geometry, as we learned on Monday, uh, encodes a lot of interesting information about how surfaces can deform, how, how their elasticity works, and so on. So today, we're going to kind of go back through Monday's lecture, right, which is all about the theory of deformation, uh, deformation from a uh, geometric standpoint. And we're going to see which of 
which aspects of that theory we can implement, uh, and which ones actually pretty much remain to be implemented. I, I, unlike some of the things that we've talked about in this class, um, deformation is this very sort of difficult, non-convex problem that, that I'd say there really isn't some overarching you know, solution with a capital S uh, to this problem. There's certainly much remaining for, for, for future research and so on. So anyway, uh, just like we mentioned on Monday, there are a lot of different ways to think about uh, deformation and a lot of problems that benefit from having sort of a formalized understanding of how surface deformation should go. Uh, probably our intuition for what surface deformation means and where the applications lie uh, show, show up somewhere in this image, right? Where the idea is that when we have a 3D character, for example, uh, we start pulling around and tucking on its various joints and, and, and different pieces and skin and so on, and we want some reasonable geometric model for how that surface should deform. Right? For instance, here, I, I think what these guys have done is they've taken a model of I don't know, some gargoyle thing where we have its arms forward and all they've done is pull it to the side and ask the question of what happens on its back, and obviously somehow we expect the deformation on the bottom to happen. Right? We don't want all of this skin to just bunch up into lines here. Uh, but, but, but why is that, either sort of from a physics, the physical standpoint or a geometric standpoint? Uh, it, it's something that takes a little bit of work to formalize and understand. Why do we care about this problem? Well, in computer graphics, we worry a lot about things like articulation and skinning and so on. By the way, are, are articulation and skinning words that we've, we've heard before? No, not so much? Okay. So these, uh, these are very common tasks in computer graphics. Articulation is... Uh, the idea is I, I give you a 3D surface, but oftentimes I want to animate a darn thing. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to give him a skeleton. Right? And, that, and that process is often called articulation. The idea is that not only do I define a piece of 3D geometry, I also define his joints and how they can move. Right? So that way when I hand my, uh, you know, my, my gargoyle off to my animators, what they can do is have a couple different knobs they can turn that will make this body turn in different ways. Right? And, 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 and defining those knobs and how they should affect the geometry is articulation. And then skinning says that if I articulate uh, one of these guys, for example, just using a skeleton, right? like a stick figure, and now I want to figure out that if I define how uh, deformations of the stick figure correspond to deformations of the outer skin of the surface. Right? So for instance, we have a human model, right? I, I might have two bones that are underlying the geometry of my arm, but in the end, there's actually something more complicated going on on the outside, right? Where, where my skin is elastic and it's pulling back in different places and responding to how that joint is moving, right? So that's the process of skinning a surface. Now, we've already learned in CS468 that simply designing a piece of geometry and understanding it is already a very difficult problem, right? If you took CS348A, uh, you learn that it's a really difficult problem even to represent a smooth piece of geometry in a nice way for, for CAD software animation or what have you. That means that doing this articulation and scanning and some of these other computer graphics tasks on top of that is an even more excruciatingly difficult process. I can tell you, actually, uh, when I was working at Pixar, they make uh, all of the technical employees go through a little one-week course on the, uh, the internal software they have there. And you know, I, when I was kind of looking forward to it as this kind of fun thing, but it's not. It turns out that a lot of these processes are completely manual and totally boring and uninteresting. And our job as differential geometers is to help these guys out. So, so let's explore some ways to do that. So, so by the way, when we talk about deformation, you might have noticed on Monday's lecture that, that at least from a differential geometric standpoint, there are a lot of different viewpoints of what the word deformation means. Some of them aren't the ones that come up in our intuition for computer graphics. Uh, for example, uh, one way to deform a surface that isn't just tugging on its joints would be the process of smoothing or fairing a surface, right? Where you take, uh, uh, for example, you take Homer and you start running one of your favorite elements on him and what comes out is this sort of scary looking human model. Uh, by the way, hopefully this guy should look familiar from your, your homework now. Um, also, the solutions to that homework, by the way, were off by a factor of a half, and I, I apologize, but not a big deal. Anyway, so from Monday's lecture, I would say one of the big takeaways is that in differential geometry, one way to think about um, deformation, and in fact, a way to think about surfaces in general that we haven't touched on a whole lot in this 
is to sort of separate uh, two different notions of the geometry of the surface. Right? So the first thing that we define is this thing called an abstract surface, which is sort of the idea of, you, you, you can think of a surface as a set of points and how they're connected to one another and some distance function or metric uh, that, that measures how far, away, uh, how far away they are and uh, angles and so on. Right? And then separate from that, you can think of an embedding of a surface, which is how it sits in, in R3. Now, it might kind of seem like these two things are the same. Right? But they're not always. Uh, so I would say the canonical example of this that, that, that's lasted for quite a long time is a map. Right? So if I give you a map of the Earth, right, and it's got North America, so I, I draw on the board, but I'm, I'm not an artist. Uh, the map of the Earth is planar. Right? It, it, it's on a sheet of paper. But when we look at that map of the Earth, we have this sort of abstract understanding that really the way that we're measuring distances and angles along that map are not just distances and angles along the sheet of paper that, the, that, that contains the map, right? So in some ways, the, the, this, this sheet of paper that's drawing my map of the Earth, you can think of this as our abstract surface, right? It's got the right connectivity, you know, at least modular the, uh, you know, identifying the outsides of the map. And maybe some scale or, or these little, what do you call those lines on, on a map? Latitude and longitude. Yeah, latitude and longitude. <laughs> which are vocabulary words I should know by my third year of graduate school, are uh, uh, some way of understanding distances and angles, right? The actual embedding of the Earth is A, far too large to fit on a, a sheet of paper, and B, curved, yeah? So anyway, uh, sort of, uh, I guess, Riemann's viewpoint on, on how geometry works is that you can sort of separate these two notions, right? That the way that you measure distances might just be some sort of bizarre metric attached to a more basic piece of topology. Right? So, so what is our viewpoint on, on surface deformation? Well, one thing we can do is say that we have sort of two options for what we can change. Right? We can either, for example, leave our surface the way that it started before deforming and then just play with its metric, right? and then maybe go back and reconstruct an embedding. Or we could just play with the embedding directly. That is, well, how do we represent a surface? Well, it's just a big pile of triangles, right? A lot of vertices and, and how they're linked together. And we can just start moving those vertices around. And as you can imagine, the, uh, the second strategy is much easier to understand. It tends to be the one that we take. But the reason that I want to put this here is that although we might be modifying the embedding directly, it's useful to characterize the effect that these modifications that we're going to be making have on the intrinsic structure and the structure of this abstract surface. Of course, there are a lot of vocabulary words that hopefully you're familiar by now in CS468 that I've used in the sentence, but really, um, this is a pretty simple statement, right? What it's saying is that, yeah, well, in the end, we're going to mess with the vertex positions, but we should understand uh, what sort of differential geometric effect we're having, right? Whether we're playing with the first fundamental form, the second fundamental form, both, neither, what have you. Um, and, and, and there are lots of different uh, types of deformations, uh, many of which we've mentioned in this class before, uh, that we can use to understand what we're doing, right? For example, isometry, right? The idea that you bend without stretching. Conformality, where you bend in a way that preserves angles, but not necessarily distances. Or elastic deformation, which is what uh, Adrian talked about, I guess, last Wednesday. Cool, so does our, our sort of high-level philosophy make sense here? Basically, there are lots of different ways we can understand how to deform a surface, but in the end, probably we're going to want, you know, a mesh that's in a different position than it was when it started out. So uh, maybe it makes sense to start with that task of just moving vertices around, but keep in the back of our heads what we're doing to this sort of intrinsic and extrinsic geometry. Okay. So we've already seen one example of a deformation algorithm on your third homework, and that's and again on uh, Wednesday's lecture, which is the idea of mean curvature flow. Yeah, so, so, by the way, did you guys all, you were able to implement this uh, thing where you smooth out homework? Yeah? It's a, it's, a, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty straightforward technique, right? It's kind of cool that, that you, can, you can implement a cigarette paper in one line of MATLAB, uh, but of course that one line of MATLAB encodes a lot of mathematics that, are, that, 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 that we really should know about. Right? So, so if you'll recall, in this class, one of the things that we've learned is that if you take this function from a surface to triples x, y, z, which is just the coordinate functions, 
and you take his gradient, what do you get out? This thing has a name. No? I've also written it right here. Ben, what do I get out of this? When I take the gradient of this coordinate function, uh, what, is the, what is this thing called? Okay, it's got an H in it. It is the mean curvature normal of the surface, right? That is, the, the, the normal of the surface is this thing that points out perpendicular to it, yeah? And it's just scaled by the mean curvature, yeah? And, and we, show, we, we showed how to derive this object both discreetly and continuously, right? And, and namely, in the discrete case, all we did is we wrote down, uh, in fact, we did this a lot of different ways, right? We did this using finite elements, and also by saying that, well, I mean, one of the ways you can think about the mean curvature normal is as the, uh, the gradient of this area function. And uh, so we could write down the area function for a set of triangles, and then we took this gradient. And now came out our, uh, our, our favorite cotangent Laplacian object. So anyway, one thing we do is say that our change in vertex positions here as a, uh, as a derivative in time is nothing more than this mean curvature normal. Right, what does this thing want to do? Well, it wants to decrease the area of the surface, for one thing. But, but, but you can think of it as, as sort of a smoothing operator, right? Because at least locally, if your surface is very noisy, the easiest way to uh, decrease the area is to just get rid of that noise. It's obviously a very high-level uh, argument, but the, the intuition, I think, is more or less true. So in your homework, remember, all we did was take uh, this differential equation and write it discreetly, right? So our derivative in time is the, 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 the finite difference in time. And then we uh, used a uh, implicit time step to help the stability a little bit. Then we can just, just hammer this thing a bunch of times. And what comes out is a nice smoothed out homer. Yeah? Well, what do, we, what do we know is going on? Well, well from a differential geometry standpoint, we're, we're, we're changing the, uh, all kinds of different aspects of the geometry of our surface, right? If we run this thing long enough, if you remember from Adrian's lecture, we can even get uh, singularities and all kinds of creepy behavior which of course is something we'd like to avoid in the end. This is sort of the simplest possible uh, viewpoint on smoothing and fairing and, and how, how it can be, you know, written as a deformation of everything. By the way, one kind of creepy uh, aspect of this algorithm that we tend to ignore, but it's kind of worth acknowledging, uh, when we talk about implicit time stepping, usually uh, the idea is that you evaluate the derivative at time t plus one, right? Oops, that should be i plus one. Um, but if you look closely at the algorithm we, written, we wrote down, we use the vertex positions at time i plus 1, put the Laplacian at time i. Remember, Laplacian involves all these cotangents and things, so it's a highly nonlinear object. Uh, so, so including Laplacian at time i plus 1 would be a very difficult solve. Uh, but it does require a little bit of proof to show that this thing diverges to so the actual mean curvature flow that we care about. Um, it's kind of an interesting detail that's not enough depth. Anyway, so like I mentioned, mean curvature flow has all kinds of strange uh, properties that, that, that are not always desirable in the meter graphics. Right? For one thing, as we, we talked about last week, it can form singularities in your surface, even if your starting point is a, is a perfectly nice, smooth object. Right? And, and sort of paralleling some of the stories that we have from, from feature-preserving smoothing and image processing, uh, sometimes surfaces have sharp things, sharp angles, and so on, that we want to keep and explicitly want to say that we don't want our smoothing algorithm to mess with it, right? And mean curvature flow doesn't really provide a nice way to, to deal with that, at least, at least in the, the, its most basic form. So uh, one, I thought I would include one other example of a uh, surface smoothing technique here. That, that's a pretty simple extension of mean curvature flow, like MC. Uh, and that's anisotropic mean curvature flow. Right? Anis anisotropic in general, of course, is a uh, vocabulary word that shows up in PDE and computer graphics, right? It means that it favors some directions over others. And uh, what these folks do is they say that, well, if your mean curvature is high enough, it actually might be an indicator that you have a sharp edge on your surface rather than just noise. Right? This is a little bit funny to think about, right? The, 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 if you have sort of small but non-zero mean curvature, this might be an indicator that your surface kind of wants to be flat, 
but, but and this is a heuristic at least, right? And but if, if your mean curvature is high enough, then you say, well, probably this sharp edge was not a mistake, at least uh, in, in some neighborhood, right? So one thing we can do is write down this nice uh, weight function here, lambda and r are parameters. What does this function say? Well, it says if your mean curvature is small enough, we're gonna have a weight equal to one, right? That's uh, the first one, and, and lambda, you know, has some sensitivity value here. And then when you go past lambda, right, as this h value gets bigger and bigger and bigger, what happens? Well, this number in the denominator gets very large, so this weight goes to zero, right? So what they're saying is that when you have mean curvature uh, beyond the special lambda, uh, we're going to start weighting things down and actually care about it less. To me, this is a really counterintuitive idea, right? So the, sort of the takeaway from image processing usually is that you know, if you've got lots of uh, very high variation, that's the place we want to smooth the most. But in fact, here they're saying, well, we want to detect edges and, and preserve them as we smooth out the surface, right? So what these folks do is they incorporate these weights into making a sort of anisotropic Laplace looking object, right? So what you do is you take, uh, remember that our, our cotangent Laplace uh, is basically just subtracting values on either end of an edge, right? And then averaging in a ring. Well, what they do is they take the weights on that edge and just scale them by this W thing here. And then they do mean curvature flow using this new object, right? Not quite a Laplace, but close enough. And uh, because of this, their algorithm is really straightforward, right? All they do here is they, uh, <coughs> they iterate over the edges and compute all of these weights, and then uh, add the, uh, the weighted mean curvature edges to their two, uh, their two vertices, and then time step a little bit, right? This is just a... Uh, Area weights, the same ones that we used to. Of course, remember this detail from our mean curvature flow method uh, without all of this uh, anisotropy, right? We have the uh, Laplacian at one time step and the vertex position is another time step. We're able to do that implicit solve. Once we've uh, introduced these weights, that solve is even more difficult. So they actually just resort to an explicit time step. Uh, so it's similar to, to what you guys implemented on homework one for curves. Um, and while this is unstable, for small enough time steps, it's okay. And uh, what they're, they're able to do is implement this loop really, really quickly so they can just do a ton of little, uh, little time steps as soon as you start So anyway, this is a nice uh, extension of mean curvature flow that lets you sort of be feature aware. Right? Feature aware mean curvature flow is a uh, phrase that we like. Uh, but of course, <coughs> This weighting function is still just a smooth function of your mean curvature. But really, it might be the case that your user just draws curves on the surface and says, like, just don't mess with this. I want to smooth it out, but this is a sharp edge, and you should acknowledge it as such. And uh, just leave it to be the curvature, you just have the curvature that it started out with. Right? So another way to think about this, uh, and, and, and yet another down, so let's keep that issue in mind. And, and another issue to keep in mind about when you're mean curvature flow is that by definition, it wants to decrease your surface area. Right, so if we thought of mean curvature flow as just a way to smooth out a surface, we actually haven't quite done that, right? Like if I do mean curvature flow in a sphere, a sphere seems pretty darn smooth, but it won't leave it alone, right? It'll shrink, it'll shrink the sphere down to a point. Now, will it do anything interesting to the geometry of the sphere? No, but, but it does somehow seem counterintuitive. This isn't quite accomplishing what we set out to solve. So one thing we might do is say, well, this mean curvature is some idea of how rough the surface is, right? But rather than to just decrease the mean curvature, maybe we'd like to have that mean curvature function itself be smooth. And um, in, the same, in the same paper that, that has this anisotropic mean curvature flow, they also discuss something called prescribed mean curvature flow, which is basically exactly what it sounds like, right? What you're going to do is write down a mean curvature function along the surface, and then I'm going to smooth that function out. That's just a scalar value function along the surface. And then write down a flow whose objective it is, is to take my initial surface and change its mean curvature in such a way that it aligns with the smooth out function that I wrote down. Now, what are the advantages of this? Well, one thing I could do is, in my smooth mean curvature sort of target function, just leave the mean curvature of the edges that I know are sharp edges alone. Right? And then, and, and so somehow smoothing out scalar functions is a much easier problem than smoothing out geometry. 
So we do that as an initial step, and then we can write down this flow here. Uh, so I, guess I wrote the discrete version here, but the continuous one isn't so hard to form it. Okay. So as always, we have our favorite mass matrix sitting in the front. And then what happens on the inside? Well, we take, remember mean curvature flow would be sort of this thing minus the second term, right? Just, uh, just takes these mean curvature vectors and use it to deform your surface. But now I'm gonna add that I have my target mean curvature function uh, times some vector field. Now of course the question is what vector field do I want to be my target for mean curvature flow? Remember that these, uh, these objects look like uh, scaled normals to my surface, right? Well, thankfully, there's actually a handy uh, fact which I'll let you guys prove at home. <clears throat> which says, let's say that I, uh, I take a vertex here and I look at his one ring, which, as always, I'm drawn with non-standard valence, but that's okay. Uh, one, one way to compute the volume, at least, of a convex surface would be that I would stick a vertex in the interior of the surface, right, and I would just connect all these points to this vertex. Hopefully the spirit of this diagram maybe makes some sense. The, 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 the basically all I'm doing is I take the one ring and I take all the vertices of this one ring and I connect them to a single point and I construct a prism out of that. And uh, right, if, if my surface is convex, one way to, uh, to compute his volume would be to simply sum up the, uh, the volumes of all the little triangular prisms that come out of each piece. And what is the gradient of that volume? Well. With respect to uh, these vertex positions, it turns out uh, that you can write it. Let's see if I get this right. <clears throat> the, the, you can say uh, the gradient of the area is nothing more than our favorite sort of discrete mean curvature, right? This cotangent thing times the gradient of this volume thing with respect to the point. Fun, uh, not quite homework problem of the day. But what does this mean? Well, it means that, that, that this guy can be written without any sort of mean curvature term, right? So these guys can cheat. This is just a function of the vertices of P, and we'll scale that by what we hope the mean curvature is, right? And what happens? What is the steady state of this uh, differential equation here, right? Well, it happens when, when, when your surface doesn't change anymore, right? Namely when dp dt is equal to zero, right? And that would be that f times v is equal to h, so in other words, this thing really wants your, your, your mean curvature normal computed two different ways to sort of align with one another. Yeah? Yes? Sir. Why is creating the volume there and not normal vector field? What was that? Why couldn't you put the normal vector field on the surface there? Because the, uh, the normal vector field is, is kind of a, it's like a weird, there's that normalization that has to happen, right? And that, that's a nonlinearity. We, we want our flow to have, to get rid of singularity between. Uh, so this is one way sort of around. No, this is a, it's a very clever trick what they do, and uh, it applies lots of information about uh, that. Yeah. This this fact apparently comes from the literature on um, what, uh, what do you call it? Area minimizing surfaces, uh, discrete area minimizing surfaces is where they found it, and then they uh, they plug it in here, and it gets a very nice smoothing method. Uh, of course, the downside here is that it's still they still have to use explicit integration, which means their time step is very limited. Cool. So anyway, that's probably not why any of you guys came to lecture today. Uh, it seems like in computer graphics, the uh, thing that we're most excited about in, in a large part of the geometry processing literature is the idea that you take a surface and deform it, right? So for instance, here's our, our favorite elephant model here. And maybe the user takes his trunk and drags it down. And obviously what we really didn't want to have happen was that just the one vertex that happened to grab moves and everything else stays the same, right? We expect the, uh, the elephant to deform in some meaningful way. Right. And ideally, we'd like to do this without any sort of articulation, right? What would be great is if I could just take a 3D scan of a single elephant and then start moving them around and my, my computer system is able to deform them in some reasonable way. Now, are we completely there yet? No, right? Solving this problem completely will require a, a, com a combination of a lot of things, right? Differential geometry to understand how the surface should deform, as well as probably some machine learning to recognize that this thing is an elephant and has joints and should deform differently from just like a piece of plastic that happens to be in this shape, right? Uh, but that aside, we can get a pretty long way just using differential geometry techniques. 
Right, so if you recall from our last lecture, uh, we had this nice geometric view of what it means for a surface to be elastic. Right, so uh, Adrian talked about if you take a surface M, I guess a manifold M, right, then as we bend and deform this manifold, one way to think about it is that this provides you from a map from this initial embedding, right, just with the sphere in this case, to this deformed embedding here. Right? All this map does is takes points to the corresponding points to one another. And uh, then you can think of your, your target surface S sub T as just uh, the, the, the map of the initial surface. Right? By the way, notice how this is one sort of clever way uh, to separate the abstract surface from uh, from, from its particular embedding over time, right? One way to think about what, what we've done here, right, is that this guy can, can, can define the, the geometry and, and topology of your starting point, and then you're changing the metric around by, by pulling it back from this, this function phi here. But that aside, uh, how do we understand how the surface was deforming elastically and where it was bending and stretching and so on? Well, remember that, that we have our original metric to the surface, right? A way to, to measure distances and angles and so on uh, is this matrix G, which was on N. We can also compute a, another matrix, I guess G sub T or whatever, that, that lives on this target surface here. And we simply compare these two, right? That is, when I stretch a surface out, all I've done is change the, uh, angles and distances along the surface that I've been stretching. Right? And somehow the amount of these angles and distances and so on are changing is some measure of the, uh, what, what has happened elastically to my surface. Right? So, so of course, uh, one way to, to do this would be to pull back the metric of this guy back to M, because right? we're going to kind of want to compare our starting point to our ending point. Right? And what ends up happening is this is nothing more than the derivative of your map from one surface to the other. This is the sort of high-level viewpoint it makes sense. Hopefully, I haven't totally uh, garbled it here. But the idea is basically the derivative of your map from your source to your target is a measure of how it's stretching. Cool. So this is sort of the starting point for a lot of elastic, uh, elastic deformation algorithms that, that we can define in differential geometry. Although we'll often find that I think they're inspired from this viewpoint and then kind of you know go off into left field a little bit and don't come back. Um, but that, that said, uh, this does provide some explanation for why these methods work and uh, what, you know, what we might do with them. So, <laughs> I guess I could have made this equation a little larger. Uh, the one viewpoint is that we have maybe a, a variational elastic energy for, for my surface, right? That is, uh, remember, at each point on my surface now, I have a different little derivative matrix that's telling me how the surface is stretching out. And now I want one sort of energy which is going to describe the total amount of stretch that my surface has undergone. Okay? So what am I going to do? Well, at each x, I can write down this little pointwise uh, guy, which is some measure of uh, how, my, how my metric matrix has changed, for example. And then integrate this along the surface. Right? And this function w is going to describe uh, what sort of uh, deformations my material likes or doesn't like. Now, do all surfaces have this property? No. Right? For example, maybe my surface has some bizarre static electricity so that faraway points can, can talk to one another. But this is one model for deformation that's very popular. And why do I need x and e of x? Well, for example, maybe my material changes along the surface. For example, I have a piece of cloth and, and I'm stitching together uh, different things with different warp and weft and so on. Uh, but, but oftentimes what we'll end up doing is ignoring x and just integrating a very simple uh, quantity that, that, that's, that's sort of uniform along the surface. This is going to be our trick, right? That we'll write down a potential energy that measures how much you like a particular map phi. And we're going to use that to kind of tug back based on the user's constraints that are, that are pulling points apart from the original surface. So let's see some examples of that. Uh, well, there are sort of two common ways that a surface tends to deform, and that's bending and stretching. Uh, this is a completely intuitive way to think about it, and in fact it is more or less physically correct, right? Which is that you can either take a surface and deform it like a sheet of paper, right? This is bending. And bending has this property uh, that, that, that distances and angles are preserved, which makes it what type of uh, deformation? Isometry, thanks guys. And uh, because of that, right, does the first fundamental form of the surface do anything interesting under an isometry? Uh, 
No, sort of by definition, right? And so, for example, one simple bending energy might measure, uh, you know, under the, the suitable choice of bases and so on, uh, just your difference in the second fundamental point, where, where, where the uh, interesting bending behavior is taking place. By the way, I guess I should have put some weird symbol here. This is not like the God-given bending energy. This is just one model. Uh, and the same for stretching. What is stretching? Well, if bending is this sort of out of plane motion, stretching is the opposite, right? I just take two ends of an elastic sheet and I yank them apart, right? And here, unlike in bending, your metric changes a lot, right? If I take a piece of elastic and I pull apart, it just got bigger. And um, this sort of behavior is, uh, you know, is actually changing the intrinsic structure of my surface. Because of that, maybe what we do is simply measure the difference in the first fundamental point. So this is going to be sort of our high-level viewpoint of deformation. The problem is that these energies that I wrote down, well, they're very nice looking, and they measure these, these very nice properties of the, of the geometry of the surface. They're highly, highly nonlinear, right? And we don't like nonlinear things in just about any area of computer science. So it means that optimization is a pain. And in fact, it means that sometimes we don't even know if we can optimize the energies we're writing down. And we'll find that that's completely the case here. Well, what's one thing we could do? Maybe we substitute in a Taylor series and we just kind of chop it off after the quadratic terms. And we see what deformations come out. And unfortunately, what tends to happen when we have these linear techniques is, for one thing, they tend to not be rotation invariant. Right? When I rotate a surface, right, the, the set of rotation matrices is not a nice subspace. Right? It looks like a sphere. And because of that, when we linearize our energies, what tends to happen is that we'll get all kinds of strange shearing and anisotropic behavior that prefers some directions over others because, well, that's effectively what we did when we linearized. On the flip side, they tend to be very fast, right? We're good at linear cells and very robust in that, well, we're good at linear cells and the matrices that we'll write down uh, tend to be quite stable under different perturbations of your geometry. So our sort of outline for, for, for the next few minutes is we'll, we'll write down a linear method and then show how it can be extended to a very popular method that's nonlinear, uh, and 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 that, that'll get us to at least one aspect of the state of the art in surface deformation. So one linear approach. And by the way, you guys should should know in, in every aspect of today's lecture, for every paper I'm, I'm writing down, there's at least 900 papers that I'm not. This is a huge, huge field of research that happens not only in computer graphics but also in engineering. Scanning, all kinds of stuff, right? Everybody wants to take 3D services, smooth them out, and deform them. It's like a totally reasonable pipeline. But anyway, one, one popular uh, option in the computer graphics literature is this thing called Laplacian surface editing. Why do you think I chose it? Well, we're really good at the Laplacian in CS468, right? This is an object that we had just hammered to death. And the nice thing is now that we understand this theory, we can go back and plug it into all kinds of different techniques that all make use of the same thing. Right? And they're all just like four extra lines of MATLAB code beyond what you implemented on what, homework three, I think, the, the cotangent matrix. So anyway, uh, as you can see, these guys uh, define a nice little pipeline here where I take my initial input surface, I draw some little blob on my surface, which is like the, the, the ring that I'm going to be willing to uh, deform, right? But I don't want to have happen as I tug on one part of the surface and like, you know, the, I tug on the head of the dragon and his tail like moves somewhere. So maybe I say this is sort of the influence of my tug. And now I grab a point, I just move it, and, and the surface deforms uh, accordingly in a nice smooth place. Okay? You can see that at least for relatively small deformations, right? Like obviously we didn't take the dragon and like stand him on his hind legs and pull him, you know, out into the side. Uh, this is a, a reasonable deformation model. But it is linear, and we'll see when that breaks down. So Although, although linear techniques are not rotation invariant, we can, cha we can hack them a little bit to at least make them translation invariant. Right? This is important. We don't want uh, you, you know, our, 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 our dragon you know, over here and our dragon slightly over there to deform differently. It's probably kind of a bizarre, a bizarre property. And then and, uh, obviously, it's pretty easy to think of ways to, to get rid of uh, 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 coordinate dependence. But these guys have a particularly slick strategy, which is that they uh, say, rather than dealing with just the x, y, z positions of all the vertices, we're going to use things called Laplacian coordinates. Right? And all Laplacian coordinates are, it's quite simple, 
is if B is my sort of n by 3 matrix of vertex positions, right? then all I'm going to do is apply a Laplacian operator to B. Right? That will give me the set of Laplacian coordinates uh, delta. Right? And, uh, so one way to think about this, right? remember what your Laplacian is making doing, is if I have a vertex and he has his neighbors, Right, then it's just the difference between this vert the, the sort of average difference between this vertex and the neighbors. Right? So some approximation of the uh, normal to the surface, I guess, uh, pointing inward. And uh, so, so really, what they're doing is playing with the surface normals, the mean curvature normals, and then reconstructing it back. By the way, other than the position of the rigid shape in space, have I lost any information by converting from b to delta? The answer is no. And the reason is that the Laplacian matrix, right, this matrix L, only has constant functions in its null space. Right? Well, what are the constant functions? Well, they're just the shifts of my surface around a three-dimensional space. So I've lost that information. But up to that, I can basically invert L, multiply it by delta, by delta and what I'll get back is the set of vertices. Yeah? Uh, this, is, this is called a Poisson equation, by the way. This is something we've seen before, which basically involves inverting Laplacian. So what do these guys do? Well, it's pretty straightforward. Well, so let's say that I, the user marks a couple points at control point C, right? and, they and they yank them out to different uh, positions they want them to go. Right? So I take the dragon and I take his, his nose and pull to my left, his tail and pull to my right. Well, oh, the second energy term here, so, so the, uh, the primed uh, vectors here are going to be the, the displaced positions of the new vertices on the surface. Right? So the second energy term here says that I want my user-constrained positions, right, these use of eyes, to match uh, the corresponding deform points as much as possible. Right? Uh, and what, what else do I want to do? Well, I compute the Laplacian coordinates of my, my input surface, right, just by applying L to the set of vertices. And I want that to look like the Laplacian surface, the coordinates of the target surface, right? So I just subtract two, square them up, and sum over all the vertices. Now, by the way, the Laplacian of my surface changes when I deform it, right? All of your cotangents once again get, get out of whack. So one thing we can do is use a Laplacian for which this is not the case, which is literally the one that puts uh, plus one on the center vertex and minus one on the neighbor vertices. vertices. And it's called the combinatorial Laplacian. And although it's not quite as geometrically intelligent, it only depends on the topology of your surface, right? So, so this operator L can be, uh, can be a constant thing that doesn't change as I deform this diagram. around. Right? So hopefully you guys can see that the, this energy that I've written down here is some trade-off between obeying what the user is asking for and preserving the Laplacian coordinates to the input surface. Right? And if I want to solve this guy for the, uh, the primed B sub i, it's nothing more than a least squares problem. Right? Out of two, here are the, here are the squares. Yeah. And uh, so solving it is, is very quick, and in fact, uh, it is, it's literally just solving the Poisson equation. Uh, here. I was going to ask, where is the bending energy? Yeah. And see, uh, see, this is the problem with this. So this is a linearization of uh, the A R P energy, if you think about it. And that will be more clear in a, about a slide or two. But even that's already a step removed from the bending energy. Can we say that L equals Hn? L equals Hn. Not quite. So it's the wrong L. Because it's the wrong L. But you hope that it's some approximation. Yeah. And so then that's kind of like H original minus H final. Yeah, so you can think of this. Well, I mean, because one of the ways you can view quantum coordinates is that really you are uh, you're saying that you don't want your mean curvature normals to take a whole lot. Okay? And that's vaguely what this is saying, although this L operator isn't quite what we wanted. Uh, yeah. But the nice thing is that we can pre-factor that L and then keep it constant. So what's the issue here? Well, the issue is that normal vectors can rotate, right? If I take my surface and I just flip them on its side, this method is going to fail, right? Because what did I do? Well, I asked that the normals stay the same, but the normals change when I rotate my surface. So, you know, so, so for example, if I take this little patch here and I, and I move them over here, and then I, I take my original delta and I put them on top of this patch, Right? These guys are isometric to one another, but our energy is going to like it because his new delta is going to point up into the right. Yeah? So we need to be able to address this problem to get any sort of practical method for deformation. 
Okay? In other words, again, normal preservation is not a rotation invariant. So what do we do? Well, one thing we do is we can add an additional set of optimization variables, and, and we'll, we'll make them uh, a, set, a, a set of matrices that rotates our original Laplace coordinates. It's a cute trick. So what we're going to say is that I want the Laplace of the output surface to match the Laplace of the input surface modulo that I'm going to be able to modify those guys by a matrix T at each vertex i. But now, what, what is the nice structure here? Well, notice what are our variables? They're the t's and the b primes. Yeah? But the t's and the b primes are never adjacent to one another. They, they appear in separate terms, right? Which means that this thing is still a least squares problem, uh, just in terms of uh, sort of two times the number of variables here. Well, of course, if I don't respect the set of t's, then, then this energy is 100% optimizable, right? What do I do? Well, at each vertex i, I just choose the t to align with whatever l I got out, and then life is good. Right? So I haven't really done anything. But the, 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 the non-trivial aspect of we say that what I'm really going to do is restrict the class of matrices that your, your little localized transformations can come from. So for example, maybe I say that I only am allowed to rotate mean curvature of bolts. Right? The t must be a rotation matrix to get to uh, the, the prime. Right? This is going to be our, our trick for, for, for getting an interesting deformation. Now, what is a rotation, or, or, or in general, a, a similarity matrix? Right? Similarity means you can rotate and then uniformly scale. You can't stretch. Uh, well, it turns out, and this is like a, a, a good high school math lemma in this paper that you can read. Uh, they take a nice, a, a nice form, which is that uh, it's some multiple of the identity matrix, plus some multiple of a skew symmetric matrix, right? Skew symmetric means uh, you know, A transpose equals minus A, right? Okay. And this is a, a, a linear condition. And some quadratic term. Well, this is a shame, right? Because this quadratic term, when I plug it into this thing, it becomes a quartic term, right? There's a square there. So our least squares problem is no longer a least squares problem. So what do we do? Well, this is where this paper uh, has to make an approximation, it becomes a linear method, we just ignore it, yeah? And we call this the, for, for small uh, rotations, this thing is very small, right? It's quadratic, and so we'll just slice it out, right? And then what we can do is plug in this form for our matrix, which is just a nice, you know, linear object, linear unknowns. We can plug them in here and just solve the least squares equation, and it's super fast to do. And for small deformations, this turns out to be an okay approximation. And uh, the, the things that come out are, are, are more or less what you would expect. Now, of course, if I take a surface and I abuse it, this method starts to break down. In fact, there's a really handy survey that you know, if you're interested in these sorts of topics, you might take a look at that, that sort of goes over different linear methods and when they tend to work and when they tend to fail. And you can see, for example, when I take a cylinder and I just drag his cap low enough, or if I twist the top of, of an object uh, far enough, Eventually, this approximation doesn't generate sort of the behavior that you would expect. Right? For example, on, on this guy, what you would hope for is that the uh, twist happens uniformly along the surface, but somehow uh, this algorithm wants to take your twist behavior and squeeze it into a relatively small piece of the surface, so that for the most part, the normals just don't change. Yeah? So in the end, although this deformation method is very quick to implement, right? if you're writing a video game, this would be a great you know, pretend that, that needed some deforming object, this might not be a bad option, right? Because it's just uh, this sort of pre-factorable linear thing. Um, in the end, it doesn't always generate deformations that we might want for the sort of higher end uh, methods for, for generating new surfaces. But thankfully, the uh, authors of that paper, uh, soon thereafter, uh, shared with us a non-linear technique that, that addresses many of these problems. And it's actually one of the ways you can think about it. It's actually a fairly straightforward extension of the, of the last paper. Right? And this is the as rigid as possible surface modeling technique. By the way, if you Google for as rigid as possible, you'll notice that there is a huge slot of papers. And this actually was not the first one. Uh, the first one, I think, was in the 90s sometime, uh, which is this sort of two dimensional uh, you know, shape deformation technique. It actually, I think, was advertised as an HCI paper because it was an intuitive. Uh, multi-touch way to, de to, to form a, uh, an object, but it turns out that, in fact, the as rigid as possible uh, method is an interesting mathematical object as well. So, 
what is as rigid as possible do? Well, it says, for if, let's say that my surface deforms isometrically. Right? Then what that means is that every vertex of my surface, I can just write down a rotation matrix that takes me from the, uh, the local neighborhood at the source point to the neighborhood at the target point. Right? Uh, this is a rotation matrix because I'm not allowing my surface to stretch or bend. Right? In other words, if I take my differences between my center point i and each of my neighbors j, right, I gotta make these differences because otherwise I have to account for translation, right? We have to deal with homogeneous coordinates and all that nifty stuff. So instead, I just subtract my neighbors, kind of like little Bajan coordinates. And I say there's some latent matrix R sub i here which rotates me from my original surface to the target. Now, do these R's exist for most deformations? Well, probably not, right? Because, again, I saw which is a very, very strong condition. But we want to approximate this, uh, th this little localized condition as much as possible. So how are we going to do that? By the way, do you guys see, sort of see the connection to the last paper here? Basically, we're going to attach a, uh, a matrix to each center vertex that's going to define the, uh, the, the, the rotation or the deformation at, at, in each localized neighborhood. We're going to optimize the R's and the P-primes all at the same time. Unfortunately, this is now a nonlinear problem. So again, uh, I guess like I just said, right, we'll, we'll write down a, a sort of similar optimization energy. Right? This thing is saying that, 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 that edge vectors uh, should deform out of these local rotation matrices. Right? We're going to put some weights in front of these that are going to prioritize some edges over others. And then how are we going to measure the deformation of the entire surface? Well, something more than a new set of weights uh, to, to integrate all of these little localized energies. Yeah, so this is just some energy that, that measures the deformation of the surface, and then sort of like what Adrian uh, mentioned earlier, right, this is some approximation of this uh, difference in mean curvature that, that we sort of set out to use as a bending energy initially. This time it definitely looks harder to see. It's, yeah, it's even harder, but if you kind of like work backward from here yeah. to the last paper to the original formula, you can see that. Um, so what ways do we use? Well, well caution is one sort of reasonable set of edge weights, right? That, 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 that measures how things are linked together on either side of an edge. And then, well, now we have a set of one-way vertex, and, and what's our favorite set of one-way vertex when we're just adding stuff up? Well, we might as well use area weights, right? So, so by the way, these area weights W sub i and this uh, pointwise caution W sub ij uh, cancel out to give you our favorite cotangent Laplacian once again. Right, so this matrix just keeps appearing. So I've written down this very nice looking energy, right? I want these little localized rotations. This is how I want my surface to deform. Uh, and, and, and probably how we expect this paper to go from here is to just say, okay, well, we'll minimize this and we're done. Um, and of course, well, that sentence sounds great. The problem is this energy is still nonlinear. Right? I've kind of hidden it from you a little bit. Right? The, the, namely, the set of rotation matrices R, right? this, this constraint that R is rotation matrix, makes this optimization a very difficult one. So we need some way to decrease this energy. And uh, what these guys do is have a nice alternating approach. So let's say that somebody gave me the set of rotation matrices for each vertex, R sub I. They're just fixed. Well, then I can find the new position of the surface in a relatively easy fashion, right? Because now the problem of finding these p primes is linear, right? This is just a quadratic energy, and these are just constants. Yeah. So if I fix the r's and I want to find the p primes, all I have to do is invert a matrix. That turns out it's the same matrix, uh, uh, relatively r's. I think, but that's uh, that's sort of that's an implementation detail from my perspective. And so, of course, the only remaining question is how do we find these R's? Well, it's a little tricky. By the way, can everybody read at least kind of see these things okay, or should I be rewriting them? Okay. Uh, yeah, just so you can't see then I'm happy to, 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 to write it on here. Anyway, we're going to define EIJ, so it's the difference between vertex I and vertex J, right? Edge IJ, reasonable enough. And what is our energy? Well, remember that the, the energy terms for matrix I only depend on the one ring of that vertex, so we can just uh, we can we can optimize each I separately. And how are we going to do that? 
Well, here's our energy here, right? We want the difference between the deformed E's and the original E's. And now we're going to fix the E, we're going to fix the deformation of the surface, and our job is to find the rotation matrix. Okay? So let's simplify this energy a little bit. Well, one thing we can do, uh, this is just, uh, you know, this is the difference of two things squared, right? We can FOIL that product. Uh, and what comes out is some linear terms, some, some quadratic terms, and so on. Uh, in fact, maybe let's do the calculation for the first line. Uh, this is not a thousand percent obvious one. Uh, let's see if I can do this calculation. It's going to be first. Okay. So again, we have uh, E i j prime minus uh, rotation and vertex i times E i j squared. Right? This is just the inner product of this vector with itself. So in particular, what do I get? Well, I get mod Eij prime squared uh, minus 2 Eij prime transpose Ri. Um, yes, I did. Okay. Eij yeah, plus Eij. Transpose R I transpose R I E J. Right, this is uh, our favorite sort of vector trick. Hopefully, uh, you guys see how I got from the left to the right. Cool. What is this matrix here? R I transpose times R. Well, remember that R sub I is a rotation. Right? What do we know about rotation matrices? What's the inverse of a rotation matrix? It's transpose, right? So this product is just the identity matrix, right? Which means that if I'm optimizing for R, the only term that matters is this middle guy. We get lucky, no? So what is that first equality at the top doing? Well, it's flipping the sign, right? I, I flipped a min to a mass. Uh, I've got rid of constants here. I suppose that should be. And, uh, and, and and that's how so that's how we get to this this, this new optimization. Yeah. Well, uh, I won't do the second one because I'm going to get it wrong. But 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 you can think of uh, actually no, this this is pretty straightforward. Um, this number inside of this R max is is a single scalar value, right? And scalars are the trace of a one by one matrix, namely themselves, right? And, 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 and matrix traces have this nice property that I can take, uh, if I have the trace of a product of a bunch of matrices, I can cyclically permute them, right? So what do I do? Well, I stick a trace outside of the sum, and then I cyclically permute enough times so that R ends up on the left. This is, uh, by the way, this is a trick that shows up in machine learning a lot. Um, and then finally, well, I'm just going to substitute S as this matrix that I get on the right hand side. I don't really care about all right, so what is our job? Well, we just sort of abstracted this thing enough times so that we, we went from uh, minimizing this as rigid as possible energy with respect to rotation matrices down to find the rotation matrix that maximizes this trace here. Right? And the nice thing is that this thing actually has a closed form solution, which is a little bit surprising. Actually, I didn't really know this until reading this paper back in the day. So how many of us have heard of these, uh, the, the, the yeah, the, the SVD of a matrix, the singular value decomposition. Cool. If you haven't, you should uh, take CS205 of the fall, which I will be teaching. But that aside, uh, and, and basically all this says is that I can take the matrix S sub i, or any other matrix for that matter, and write it as the product of three things, right? An orthogonal matrix times this uh, diagonal matrix sigma with positive entries times another orthogonal matrix transpose. Fun fact of the day, if you haven't seen it before. Uh, and it's very easy to compute this SVD. It comes from the uh, eigen decomposition of S. Or I guess of, of S train for this. Anyway, so let's, uh, let's substitute that guy into this trace that we have upstairs. So this is trace of R times S, which is same as trace times R times U sigma V transpose. Right? And all I'm going to do is I'm going to apply our favorite cyclic permutation uh, trick for trace, once again, to take this V and move them on to the left. Right? So now I have the trace of V transpose RU times sigma. 
Yeah? Well, this product here is a product of a bunch of rotation matrices, so it's just another rotation matrix, R squiggle here. Yeah? So this is a trace of some rotation times, uh, times this diagonal positive matrix. Right? Uh, now, now uh, one, one way to take the trace of a product of two things is to, uh, to take, it's, it's just the, sorry, the trace of the product of two matrices is nothing more than you take the element-wise product of these two guys and, um, and you sum them all together. Does that sentence make sense? So if I have a matrix, if I have two matrices like uh, A11, A22, or uh, 1, 2, A21, A22, and now multiply that by B, multiply the same matrix B in the same form, and I take the trace of this whole darn thing, right? This is like A11, B11, plus A12, B12, and so on. Right? This is uh, surprising, <laughs> but, but, but you can check it pretty easily. The nice thing is that sigma is a diagonal matrix, so it's enough to just take the dot of the diagonals of these two guys. And think about it, the diagonal of a rotation matrix has a pretty nice property that its elements have got to be less than or equal to 1. In particular, what this means is that this trace of this product here is less than or equal to the sum of the uh, singular values, the numbers that go along the diagonal of sigma. Yeah? Well, so I just gave you an upper bound for the thing that I'm trying to maximize. So all I've got to do is give you something that achieves that upper bound, and I know that I've maximized this function. Yeah? Indeed. Well, uh, so, so when is this thing maximized? It's maximized when I take r tilde to equal the identity. But remember, we know what r tilde is. It's the product of uh, these three guys here. So when I undo it, right, I left multiply by v and I write multiply by u transpose. What I get out is that the rotation matrix is, uh, can be written in closed form from the SVD of S. Yeah? In fact, this is just a 3 by 3 SVD. It's very fast to compute. And so what did I do? Well, I showed you that if I give you the vertex positions P prime, uh, you can give me back all of the R sub i twelve vertices by just solving these little itty bitty singular value uh, problems for vertex. So what's going to be our uh, our strategy here? Well, it's simply to alternate, right? So the very first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to have an initial guess of where I think vertices are going to go and an initial guess of these R's. Then I'm going to fix the R's and solve the vertices, right? That'll change them a little bit. Now I'm going to fix the vertices and solve for the R's. I'm going to fix the R's and solve the vertices, and I'm going to repeat this thing until it converges. And what I know is every time I do that, the air and heat energy that I wrote down before gets a little bit smaller, right? It monotonically decreases. So eventually, at least that energy will converge. Does it have to converge to a global optimum? No, right? All I'm doing is I'm making little steps that decrease in energy. But for example, you know, I could. Uh, take small steps to get me closer and closer to this, this local minimum and then never even see that there's a better uh, optimum. So, so what do we do? Well, for one thing, we pray. And we also give this thing a good initial starting point. Okay? So the usual strategy in implementing ARIP is that you actually implement the Laplacian coordinates paper that I already mentioned, right? this linear technique, which gives a good initial guess for how we think the surface definition is going to go. And then we just add these iterations on top of it to take your surface to what you were really looking for. Okay? So in other words, our, our modeling, uh, our, our paradigm kind of looks like, you know, your, your, your user fixes a bunch of targets for where you think the vertices are going to go. You, you use a simpler method to do some approximation deformation you want, and then you just alternate to uh, improve. And the results are surprisingly good, even though this thing is uh, non-convex. So for example, uh, Remember that the, the, the Laplacian coordinates figure doesn't deal very well with things that kind of shear, right? So if, it, if uh, I, I give you a what, this sort of square-looking cylinder object and I just shear the two, the top and bottom away from each other, uh, the initial gas, the deformation tends to look something like this thing here, right? So it's just kind of sheared to the left a little bit. And then as you iterate A or a P, it's going to widen out the interior because it's a, sort of a better approximation of the seismometry property that we're looking for. And similarly with the second guy. This is a humongously influential paper, partially because this technique actually can be done in real time. 
Right? At least for reasonably sized meshes. So let's see if my computer is willing to play this YouTube video inside of the PowerPoint. Nope. Okay, so let's uh, <laughs> load that up in a separate window. You can see what area it looks like. Oh, most of the papers we talked about have nice uh, online video clips that you can watch. Uh, yeah, so they take this input surface here and uh, they define some constrained uh, vertex positions. You can drag them around and you can see that it's viewed on the surface to form along with it in, a, in an intuitive enough way. Now notice that if they, they punch it down low enough, eventually your approximations start to come into play and uh, maybe the, 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 the area of heat iterations don't converge or don't keep you exactly what you want. But in general, this is a very good model for surface deformation. And uh, in only something like four or five iterations, oftentimes we'll converge, at least for uh, simple enough surfaces. Maybe so maybe we'll fast forward to a more interesting example. Uh, here's what. So here's our favorite armadillo. And you can see the drag around, and then everything happens in more or less the way that you would expect. Okay. Now, having done a few homeworks in uh, Geometry processing, you might uh, recognize that this is not the original armadillo model, right? This is a very downsampled version of, of the original guy who has, you know, nice uh, spikes on his back and so on. That's because the ARP, the more triangles you add, uh, the more R's you get to solve for, the more iterations you need, and so on. Uh, so, so in some additional work that's happened afterward, uh, might do things like solve the ARP on a course approximation room mesh and then refine it in such a way that you get a deformation of the original surface, right? But for these guys, they just use a, a downsample version. Cool. So anyway, it's a fun technique. It works pretty well. So, uh, uh, ooh, I'm already running. Thanks. Okay, so I only have, oh man. I only have five minutes, so we're gonna just kind of mention the last thing I wanna talk about today. And that's a uh, completely different application of surface definition. So, so far, the, uh, one of the sort of our, our main fairing energy for surface that we've talked about is this is basically the surface area, right, that we differentiate to get mean curvature flow. But in general, mean curvature is some notion of the bend of a surface. And maybe we we'll want to measure that directly. Right, so there are lots of ways to do this, and one, one option that's appeared a lot in the discrete differential geometry literature is this thing called the Wilmore energy of the surface. Where all I'm going to do is take the uh, mean curvature of the surface and square it and integrate it along, integrate it along the whole darn thing. In fact, Wilmore's energy also subtracted off the Gaussian curvature and integrated it along the surface as well. But if you remember from uh, Adrian's lecture, what, two weeks ago? Uh, they integral the Gaussian curvature by the Gauss-Binet theorem has to do with just the topology of the surface, right? So if I deform this guy, uh, the second term doesn't have much of an effect. But the first guy is easy to write down. For example, it's the Laplacian coordinate function. And, uh, right, so we've now written down all kinds of different ways that we can understand the mean curvature of the surface in computer. Now, why do we like the Wilmore energy? Well, at least when we include this curvature term, remember that H is the, uh, the average of the two principal curvatures, and K is the product. Right, so algebraically, when you go back through and substitute it up, work your way backward, you'll notice that all this uh, energy is doing is measuring the difference in the two principal curvatures integrated along the surface. Right? In other words, what this energy really wants right, is k1 to equal k2. That is, that sort of your surface has this nice isotropic shape to it. So this is uh, a very nice property. In fact, it's also conformal invariant in the sense that if you uh, conformally, right, if you deform the surface, the uh, space that the surface is sitting in, uh, in a conformal way, so you, you preserve angles, uh, then this energy doesn't change. So, for example, in R3, if you do one of these Mobius transformations of uh, space then this, uh, then, and apply it to the surface, then life is good. By the way, it's a fun research opportunity. And there's uh, lots of interesting discussion on this energy online. And, uh, <laughs> I like that these people ask for a tweetable way that the Wilmore energy is Mobius invariant. And the number one answer is, is most certainly not tweetable. So I will offer some extra credit if somebody has a better, example, <laughs> a better uh, explanation of what these guys have. That is said, uh, what is that? <laughs> tweetable, 140 characters or less, and certainly no angles. 
Uh, anyway, so 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 why why might we want this thing? Well, remember that the, the Wilmore energy is some measure of the bending of the surface. In fact, it turns out to be a very popular measure uh, for a uh, application in dynamics. Right. So you can think of the as rigid as possible solve as sort of a static version of um, surface deformation, right? Where I write down an energy and I immediately just jump to its minimum, and that's what I care about finding. But in simulation, maybe I write down an energy that is expressing how much a surface doesn't like to be bent, but I don't want to just flip to his bottom, the bottom energy state. But instead, I have to show how the surface is going to deform over time to respond to this potential energy. Right? And uh, so, for example, right, these developable surfaces, like paper, have zero Gaussian curvature. So the entire amount of bend of the surface is encoded in that mean curvature value that we're going to integrate. Right? And so one bending energy for cloth and paper and, and sheet metal and so on is nothing more than this Wilmore guy. And his surface basically wants to undeform himself in a way that makes this uh, Wilmore energy happier. Right? Now, of course, for simulation, there are a lot of desirable properties that you might want for bending energy for surface beyond just these geometric ones. Right? In particular, remember that simulations are very expensive. They require all this time-stepping and linear solves and non-linear solves and so on. So what we like is that your energy is quadratic and some, of course, it should be invariant under isometry. Right? We have to define what isometry means in this case. And these guys say that you preserve edge lengths of your surface. And we'll come back to that in a second. And there's a variant of rigid motion and scaling, and basically, although I think we're too low on time to go through this argument in any detail, right? Certainly, because your energy is quadratic, it takes the form of uh, something like this upstairs. And this matrix has a couple different nice properties. And it's, it's row sum zero, it's column sum is zero, it's positive semi definite, because it's an energy function, and so on, right? And in fact, we make one additional argument, which is that. If I double the size of my surface, what should happen to the Wilmore energy? This is, uh, I don't know if this is something you guys can do here. So if I scale the surface up by a factor of two, remember that curvature looks like one over distance. Wilmore energy looks like curvature squared. So, it, so your Wilmore energy will go down by a factor of four. Right, so I scale my surface by S, my Wilmore energy goes down by S squared. What was that? Oh, I'm sorry, yes, I mean, so, so the, the, the energy density goes down by S squared, which is what's measured in Q, and the uh, energy goes down by S. Yes, good catch. Uh, so, so one thing you can do would be to try and separate these two properties, because other than that, the Wilmore energy shouldn't change in any interesting way. So I'll write down one energy term, L, which will look like this sort of scale invariant version of Wilmore energy, and then I'll just build in this matrix that scales the way that I want. Well, this form looks awfully familiar, right? We have a uh, more or less diagonal matrix that's building in scaling behavior. And then we have this thing here, which is measuring what? Mean curvature, once again, right? So what do you think ends up happening? This just looks like finite elements, once again, right? So one reasonable way to write down the, uh, the Wilmore energy of the surface is simply to put the cotangent Laplacian in here for L and our favorite mass matrix in here for M. And it turns out that not only is this thing, you, you know, it can be used as a little function, but it also can be used uh, to measure this energy term, which is very desirable for cloth simulation, right? And we can make one additional observation, is that if my surface deforms isometrically, then this Q matrix doesn't change, right? By definition, I construct a Q in an isometric way. So if I, I deform my surface in an isometric way, it doesn't change. And what that means is that I can take my input piece of cloth, write down this Q matrix, prefactor it, do as much as I can to make math involving this Q object easy, and then use it for all the time steps of my simulation without ever having to update it. And so this is big savings for these simulation folks, because now instead of having to solve a linear system from scratch in each time step, they can already get themselves halfway simply by, by examining this matrix that doesn't change. And this is sort of the big win of this paper. Right? So, so all they do is they plug Q into uh, cloth simulation. Right? This is actually it's a four-page paper it's, uh, in, in SGP. And, and that's because the, the results are much faster and good and, and very easy to describe. And uh, you can see that the, the cloth simulation on the left, which is one of these big nonlinear models, and the one on the right, which comes from uh, this new energy, has pretty much the same behavior. 
In fact, they show that, that for a bunch of different stiffnesses for your cloth, uh, you, can, you can replicate different interesting curvature behavior. So you can see that as you increase the uh, sensitivity to this little more energy, your surface tries to resist bending more and more. Now, one final question that I'll leave you guys with, and we'll stop for today, is what happens if I crank this energy? So there are sort of two terms here. Right? This is bending and stretching term. You can see the cloth is stretching a little bit, so it falls down on the sphere. What happens if I crank the Wilmore energy term up as high as it can go? Well, what I'd like to have happen is to have my surface only deform uh, like a sheet of paper. Right? The, 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 if I add a constraint now that my surface has to deform isometrically, uh, then, no, then you can also uh, flow this energy that smooth surface itself. We'll be able to talk about it. But anyway, as, as I crank this stuff up, what I'd really like to have happen is to have it just deform like a sheet of paper. But in fact, an issue that we talked about in uh, week 10, right? so I guess that was four or five weeks ago now, comes back into play. Right? So remember our definition of isometry was deformation that keeps the edge lengths constant. So remember my favorite evil match for, for, for geometry methods is, is surprisingly simple to draw. Right? It's this guy on the board here. And what happens if I deform him while, while literally building the, the edges of this mesh on the toothpaste? Well, it's perfectly happy to bend vertically, horizontally, and this way diagonally. But what happens if I try and bend the surface along this axis here? Well, it can't. It's completely rigid. Right? But that shouldn't be the case if what I really care about is just deforming the square like sheet of paper. Right? So coming up with a deformation model that is completely isometric in some reasonable way is still basically an open problem and one that's really worth thinking about. Very challenging. So anyway, today we talked about three different ways to deform a surface by smoothing and varying it by doing sort of the static deformation, where you write down energy and minimizing it, or a dynamic one, where you write down an energy and then simulate, you know, do, do Newton's equations with it. And in each case, right, there's different, both sort of underlying geometric models and different discretizations that are useful. And again, this is the tip of a huge iceberg. So I, I put down two uh, resources that might be handy. There's this mesh processing book, uh, which is sort of the only reference we have right now in uh, the area of geometry processing, which has a couple chapters on deformation. And in fact, in previous years, CS468, uh, rather than focusing on differential geometry, one or, one or two versions of this class that have done uh, deformation in a more comprehensive way. And thankfully for us, their websites remain on the internet, and you can look at some of their slides for information. So anyway, that concludes today's lecture. Remember that class ends after this Wednesday. Uh, your homeworks and projects are, are nearly due, and uh, you know your course evaluations are much appreciated, and I'll, I'll see you guys soon. Thank <sighs>